Cure, Connect, Transform. There is no greater embodiment of Mayo Clinic's plans to revolutionize healthcare than the Center for Individualized Medicine. We discover, translate, and apply new individualized medicine advances in patient care. Using genomics and multiomics could lead to vast advancements in knowledge of the causes and risk factors for many diseases. Our researchers and clinicians work together to accelerate discoveries in four strategic areas. Simplify and scale. In Genomics in Action, we work to transform the practice by providing the knowledge, tests, and tools needed to make it easier for clinicians to integrate genomics into routine patient care. Individualizing cures with genes, bugs, and drugs. Cutting-edge therapies being developed with high-definition therapeutics are driving precision medicine science beyond diagnostics to provide personalized cures. Connecting data to practice, our exciting work with Omics Data Platform is centralizing genomic and multiomic data into a single repository which will allow for the most individualized medical approaches possible. A multiomics future. In Beyond DNA, we are advancing patient care by using molecular information from the microbiome, epigenome, exposome, and more. The Center for Individualized Medicine and Mayo Clinic are in a unique position to fuel new discoveries to improve care for patients powered by sophisticated research and artificial intelligence. From providing the best individualized care to addressing the world's most challenging healthcare problems, Mayo researchers here are relentlessly pursuing discoveries that deliver hope and better health to people today and for generations to come. Thank you. Good morning or afternoon, wherever your time zone exists. My name is Denise Dupra, and I am the Associate Director for Education for the Center of Individualized Medicine at the Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota. I would like to welcome you to the Center for Individualized Medicine Grand Rounds. The CIM Grand Rounds Lecture Series is designed to highlight the latest in scientific discovery and innovation, and demonstrate how individualized medicine is being translated into practice to meet current and future patient needs. It is my great pleasure to introduce today's presenter, Dr. Heidi Rehm. Dr. Rehm is a professor of pathology at the Harvard Medical School and the chief genomics <laughs> officer in the Department of Medicine at Massachusetts General Hospital. She is also the co-director of the program in Medical and Population Genetics, Broad Institute. Her focus is on developing standardized processes to integrate genomic, genomics into medical practice. As a medical director of the Clinical Research Sequencing Platform, she is guiding genomic testing for research and clinical use. She is a leader in defining standards for the interpretation of sequence variants and a principal investigator of ClinGen, which is Clinical Genomic Resource, a major NIH-funded effort providing free and public accessible resources to support the interpretation of genes and variants. Dr. Reem also co-leads the Broad Center for Mendelian Genomics, focusing on discovering novel rare disease genes and the matchmaker exchange to aid in gene discovery. She is a strong advocate and pioneer of open science and data sharing through her role as a vice chair of the Global Alliance for Genomics and Health. Dr. Reem is a principal investigator of the broad LMN Color All of Us Genomics Center, supporting the sequencing and return of results to a cohort of 1 million individuals in the US and co-leading Gnome AI, sorry, the Genomic Aggregation Database. Despite major advances in deciphering the genome, barriers to incorporating genomics into clinical care abound, something I recognize every day in my own primary care practice. Overcoming these barriers requires extensive infrastructure, including standards, knowledge bases, and global data sharing, as well as innovative solutions and a rich interface between research and clinical care. This presentation will present both local and global efforts to support clinical genomics from diagnosis to gene discovery. Today's presentation is titled 
advancing genomic medicine through global collaboration and data sharing. Throughout this talk, please use the Q&A in Zoom to submit your questions. We have planned time for Q&A at the end of the session. For those who have not yet claimed continuing education credit, a message will be sent out in the chat shortly that will supply you with the code again so that you may get your CME credit. Now, please join me in welcoming Dr. Heidi Rehm. Thank you, Dr. Rehm. Mute myself. Thank you. That that was a very generous introduction. And I'm just working on sharing my slides. All right. Well, it's a real pleasure to be able to, I wish I could be there in person, um, but uh, we're all reaping the benefits of uh, not having to commute into work these days, right? Um, so I, as was mentioned, I'm going to talk about advancing genomic medicine through global collaboration and data sharing uh, and talk about some of the work that we've been doing. Um, I do have, uh, I don't have any disclosures related to this talk, um, and I did define several learning objectives that are shown here around uh, the topics I'll touch on today. So to contextualize this talk and, and a lot of the work that I do, I, I have been using the 10 bold predictions for 2030 from NHGRI or the National Human Genome Research Institute. And, and these came out just now a couple of years ago. Uh, and then they did a series of lectures and they're really well done. And so I encourage you, if you're interested in following up more on genomics, that you can go and li listen to the leaders in each of these 10 areas talk about the future of these areas. Um, in the time we have today, I don't have time to go through all 10 of these bold predictions around genomics, but I will touch on four that relate most directly to the work that I do. And so I'm gonna start with um, bold prediction number two, which is that the biological function of every human gene will be known. And for non-coding elements in the human genome, such knowledge will be the rule rather than the exception. Um, and in fact, you know, it's critical that we understand the function of the genes in our body, because in fact, those genes, when disrupted, underlie human disease and allow us, and by understanding them, it allows us to diagnose the cause of human disease. And one of the most direct ways to understand the function of the roughly 20,000 human genes we have in our, in our genomes is to observe what happens when you disrupt them. And that can be either through understanding the genetic basis of human disease, um, or by generating animal models where we intentionally disrupt certain genes and see what happens. Um, so an example of using human disease to understand the function of genes, um, some of you may know that Reggie Lewis, a famous basketball player, died suddenly. And in fact, he died of a disorder, one of the more common rare diseases called hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, found in about one in 500 individuals. Uh, and this disorder leads to a thickening of the heart wall. Um, and that um, thickening is based on disruption of the muscle fiber, the, the proteins that control the contraction of muscle fibers in the heart. And by observing that disease, understanding its role in the heart and what the proteins are doing, we actually can understand the function of these genes. And, and those are things we need to know if we ever want to intervene and actually treat and target these disorders to improve outcomes. Also, I have a picture of mice right there. It turns out our hearing system and our vestibular system are very similar organs uh, in our inner ear. Uh, and a lot of the ways we've discovered the genes involved in hearing and hearing loss are from finding mice that circle and dance and twirl and do weird looking things because their vestibular system is messed up. And in fact, when we then test their hearing, they can't hear either. So we, we often uh, identify genes involved in hearing loss from mouse studies. Um, however, we, we've come a long way. In fact, using the OMIM databases, which is a database a lot of us use to that documents new gene disease discoveries, um, there has been about four, over 4,600 4, genes that have been implicated in at least one disease from the roughly 20,000 genes in our genome. However, every time we sequence an individual that we suspect has a genetic disorder, only about a quarter of the time do we find the underlying cause. And three quarters of the time, we can't identify the cause of disease. And in fact, from other studies that have been done, there's evidence that there's at least 10,000 more genes yet to be discovered 
for Mendelian or rare disease, uh, diseases due to a single gene defect. And is that for that reason that we started the Broad Center for Mendelian Genomics now seven years ago um, and the Rare Genomes Project to try to better capture these different genes that cause rare disease uh, and understand their function. So our Rare Genomes Project enrolls individuals in the United States um, and, and this map. So we enroll mostly through social media and, and uh, throughout the community. Uh, and in blue are the location of all the families that we've recruited into the study. In orange are the families where we have found the diagnosis and returned the result to the family, despite the fact that most of these patients have been through long diagnostic odysseys uh, for which clinical testing never revealed the answer. But through our research program, we've been able to discover novel causes of disease or sometimes known causes of disease that were missed in clinical testing or the knowledge wasn't there when they first got tested. Um, now, that's a project where we directly enroll individuals. We also have a program where we collaborate with other investigators around the world um, that have each been recruiting families with rare disease through their own efforts uh, that are often disease specific, maybe studying retinal diseases or cardiac diseases or uh, kidney diseases and so on. Uh, and through that, we've been able to amass over um, samples from over 15,000 individuals and generate um, novel gene discoveries. In fact, we've now hit 926 novel gene disease discoveries or candidates. So about 322 are what we consider well-supported novel gene discoveries. And then another 600 are in the candidate stage. They look interesting, but we don't yet have enough evidence to prove that they're causal for rare disease. So how do we build the evidence? If we, if we find an interesting candidate, but we don't have enough evidence, enough cases, or enough uh, functional data, other things. Well, one of the most powerful tools that we use today uh, is through the concept of matchmaking. Um, and so the principles of gene matching are that, you know, if we find a case and we find a, a gene disrupted in an individual's genome, but that could just be random, um, what we need to do is find another individual who also has a disruption of that same gene and they have the same phenotype or clinical presentation. And if we can pull those together, we start building evidence. And sometimes we need two or three or four cases, depending on how unique and rare that phenotype is, um, but we can bring several cases together. And in fact, we built a platform seven years ago called the Matchmaker Exchange. It's one of the, probably the first genomic federated genomic data sharing platform. What does that mean by federated? It means the data can stay in the respective databases in the respective countries around the world. In a lot of countries, they can't send genomic and phenotypic data outside the walls of their country, but we can query uh, through common application programming interfaces and we can send questions. It's kind of like playing go fish. So I put in a case and I say, we found this candidate gene, gene XYZ, and has anyone gotten a match? Do they find a disrupting variant in that same gene? And if we match, the system brings us together, sends an email to both the parties and say, you're a match. Uh, and then we've exchanged detailed phenotypic data to see if the patients actually have the same disorder. If they do, that builds evidence. If they don't, it's probably a false positive. We've been doing this now for seven years. We just wrote a review on the progress from this platform. And in fact, there's been over a thousand novel gene discoveries using this platform um, that, that are in the, this publication. And in fact, lots more data waiting to be matched on sitting in this database. So just an incredibly powerful resource that's being used around the world to implicate new genes in disease. And just by way of an example, this is one of our Rare Genomes Project cases, um, two siblings with neuro, uh, neurodevelopmental disorder. Uh, we entered this candidate gene, look, based on a couple of suspicious looking variants into the system. We matched with Joe Gleason's lab in California. Uh, and in fact, he'd already by then assembled seven families together from matching. Um, and we were family number eight, joined that effort. He'd already made a mouse model and done some functional studies. And we were able to get a diagnosis to that family within a matter of weeks um, by, through this matching process long before the publication actually came out another year later. So a really powerful system to, to share data and get answers. Um, so if we go back to this bold prediction that every human gene um, will be discovered by 2030, now eight years away, 
Um, I would guess that we'll probably be at 80%. <laughs> um, we will have made even more progress, but we'll still not quite be there yet. It's still a lot of work, especially for the rarest of these disorders. Um, okay, now um, the next one I wanted to tackle is that generating and analyzing a complete human genome sequence will be routine for any research laboratory. So will we make progress on this? Um, so I would actually argue um, that this one will be easy, but not quite the way that the question is posed. Um, uh, so we already are close to this. Lots of our laboratories generate whole genome sequence, sequence data, but not all genome results are created equal. We have constant innovation in the sequencing technology. In fact, um, just uh, in the last hour, Illumina made a major announcement about innovation and cost reduction in their sequencing platform. Um, there are new variant detection met methods coming up every day, analytical approaches to identify causal variation being constantly innovated on. And such as, as such, the quality and completeness of a genome sequence is actually quite variable depending on who does it and what level of completeness and, and et cetera. However, if we all work together and share tools and methods and platforms freely, we will all have access to state-of-the-art approaches for genome analysis. And on the right side is a table, just to give a sense of the complexity that I'm talking about, of all the different types of variants, like single nucleotide variants, or insertions and deletions, or larger copy number variants, or balanced or complex structural rearrangements of genomic data, runs of homozygosity, variants and regions of homology, short tandem repeats in our genome, mitochondrial variants, mosaic variants that aren't in all of our tissues. And the diagnostic potential of each of these variants varies, but most of them contribute significantly to diagnoses. And the ability of an exome or a genome to detect this these types of variants varies. Some is very good, others still emerging. And so again, depending on what genome you're running and what analytical tools you're using, you may have a good or better or best genome. So, um, so we really need to share in all of these algorithms that we're using. Uh, in fact, we are now working with cloud-based platforms. For example, the Anvil platform is the cloud-based platform that the National Human Genome Research Institute funds and requires all of their funded grants and the data generated to be put on that platform, um, not only the data, but the tools as well. And so all of the rare disease data being generated in our program and other NIH funded um, programs are being put on Anvil um, and also many different tools. This model will allow every lab to routinely access and contribute to genomic analysis and run the best in class pipelines. Um, right from their own desktop and, and interacting with this data and, um, and algorithms. And in fact, we took our rare, rare disease genomic analysis platform called Seeker, and we installed it on Anvil, and it is now ac accessible to the entire community. Um, and you can go to seeker.brodisu.org and learn more about it. We have tutorials and the data, um, the source code is actually open source so that other groups can contribute innovations to this um, platform. We have 11,000 hits, you know, uses a month on, on this platform because we're sharing it and working as a collective community to continue to innovate and build off of it. So it's just a, a slightly different framework from how we're doing this. And in fact, a computational bio biologist, Aaron Quinlan out at University of Utah, um, saw our data in Anvil and he was testing out a new structural variant caller and he used our data and was able to actually make a diagnosis for us off of our own data with his new structural variant caller. And we diagnosed this case because of that collaborative effort. So again, you know, I can give many, many stories like this that really reap the benefits of collaboration and, and sharing. Now, in order to share and inter, you know, use each other's data, we have to generate the data and the tools in standardized ways that we can all share and interoperate. And so I've been engaged with the Global Alliance for Genomics and Health now for um, probably eight years. Um, and we support technical work streams, building standards. We interact with the what we call driver projects, which are the well-funded programs doing the science, doing the clinical work, launching programs. 
and they inform the standards that are needed. And then when built by Global Alliance, implement them in their environments. And that allows us all to better share data and tools and um, collectively improve the state of genomics for the entire community. And here's another platform we're now working on. I told you about the Matchmaker Exchange where we exchange genes and their linkage to disease. We're now working to build a federated variant matching program so you can just enter a variant. And if someone around the world has that variant and has a phenotype, we can get that and share it through a query-based system, uh, federated access to genomic data sets around the world. Um, and this is just um, evolving right now as we work on the standards and the data sets that will be shared in this environment. Um, so if we get back to this question about, you know, this will become routine for any lab? Yes, absolutely. But it will be in part because of community built platforms that we all share in. Okay, we're on to the third bold prediction I'll tackle, which is number seven the clinical relevance of all encountered genomic variants will be readily predictable, rendering the diagnostic designation variant of uncertain significance obsolete. Wouldn't we all welcome that, <laughs> those of us who deal with variants of uncertain significance? So I actually just finished a project generating, or I should say gathering data from over 1.5 million tests run in the US over the last couple of years, 2020 and 2021, from um, most of the major clinical laboratories in North America. And you can see the list here on the right. I just posted a preprint on MedArchive within the last week, um, summarizing this data. And what we basically wanted to answer was, um, there's been criticism, you know, you should, you should order panels and insurance won't cover anything but a panel because those genomes generate too much uncertainty. There's all these VUSs, it's gonna to lead to downstream healthcare costs with following up on all these VUSs. And being a laboratory director, my suspicion was, I, I think that's not correct. I, I actually think panels generate more uncertainty. So I said, well, we can solve this answer to this question. Let's just collect all the data from all the laboratories and see which one generates more uncertainty. So we did that. Um, and in fact, because of this concern, more data is being generated for panels than genomes and exomes. 96.8% of the data uh, of the test run in the two year period were panels. But we did have 50,000 or almost 50,000 exomes and genomes from these different labs. What we found was, in fact, um, my suspicion was correct. Panels. Um, generated more uncertainty. 32.6% of panels had a v an inconclusive result due to only having a VUS or more than one VUS on the report, whereas genomes or exomes only had 22.5%. Uh, and this is statistically significant difference. Um, also, we, we tracked diagnostic yield. And as we all already suspected, Genomes and exomes generate higher diagnostic yield as well, 17.5%, compared to panels at 10.3%. This correlates very directly with the size of the panel. Um, here, as the panel size increases, the rate of inconclusive results due to VUSs increases as well, um, um, yet dropping when you hit genomes and exomes. Uh, you can see the relative volume of um, the different sized panels and genomes at the bottom panel. Um, we also looked more deeply at the genomes and exomes because when we run genomes and exomes, we often run what we call a trio, where we're testing the parents and the individual. Uh, that way we can determine if there's de novo variants that have arisen brand new, those are more suspicious for being pathogenic. And we can phase variants for recessive disorders you know, do these two variants, are they in the same allele and they're only disrupting one copy of the gene or are they in two different alleles um, from mom and dad and that both um, copies of the gene are disrupted? That information we can directly generate and use in our analysis of the genome data if we run a trio. And sure enough, what we found is the diagnostic yield was increased um, statistically significantly in trio testing and the rate of inconclusive results was decreased also statistically significantly um, from this analysis. So more important to run trios. Interestingly, we never run trios for panel-based testing, um, and we should. Um, it also interestingly, um, when we looked, there were two laboratories in the 19 
that actually subdivided their VUSs into those that are more suspicious for pathogenicity and those that were less suspicious. And we put them into VUS high, mid, or low. Um, and what you see here is that when you're doing panel-based testing, which is the blue bars, you have a rough distribution of VUSs in all categories getting reported back to patients. But at the genomes, what you see is none of the VUS lows get reported back and only VUS high and mid are going back. And that's because we're thoughtfully thinking about what VUSs we're returning to individuals. Um, and the reason overall that panels generate more uncertainty is because the policy is the physicians don't give phenotype and you just report all VUSs and above for diagnostic panel-based testing that you find in a panel. And as the size of the content gets bigger, the likelihood you have more VUSs coming back is higher. In a genome, we indeed are um, uncovering thousands of VUSs, but we only report them if there's a very strong correlation between the gene in which we identified the variant and the phenotype of the patient. And we've been given phenotype because we require it for genomic testing from the physician. And that allows us to be informed in which variants we report and be very selective. That is why the rate of uncertainty is actually lower with genomic testing. That said, no matter which test you use, we still generate VUSs and we're still challenged. And in fact, most variants in our genomes are rare. We each have about 200 rare coding variants that are affecting genes. The evidence we use to interpret those variants is often unpublished and inaccessible amidst the various clinical labs that are doing the testing. Um, and it re requires professional training. We spend on average an hour per variant uh, interpreting these. Um, yet, if you look on the ClinVar database where we're sharing data, and we now have 2.4 million classified variants shared from laboratories, um, about 65,000 of those variants have conflicting interpretations. The largest proportion are uncertain. So we still have a long way to go to figure out what these variants mean. And that brings me to the Clinical Genome Resource Program, where we are bringing the community together to generate a resource that defines the clinical relevance of genes and variants for use in both medicine and research. It's an NIH program that was started um, in September 2013, primarily funded by three core grants. Uh, I have one of those grants um, with my colleagues at Geisinger, um, and there are two other grants. And then there's an increasing number of disease-focused um, grants that are funding specific disease areas. And we really work to aggregate data, um, both genomic and health data, and use that data to curate um, whether a gene is associated to disease or a variant is pathogenic, or the removal or deletion of a gene in the genome causes disease, or if we return information to an individual that it's actionable for their healthcare. These are all areas of curation for our program. And then we disseminate this knowledge uh, freely to the community through our clinicalgenome.org website. The two most critical areas within that curation are genes and variants. And so we developed a framework and a, and a semi-quantitative semi approach to score evidence to define whether a gene that's been published in the literature with evidence to implicate it in disease actually has sufficient evidence. And we now have 45 gene curation expert panels in different disease areas, as well as 53 variant curation expert panels in different disease areas. And they are curating this knowledge um, across all of their respective disease areas using the standards that we've published. Um, and what we've found, um, and, and also ClinGen, not the only group curating gene disease relationships. There are other groups, both public resources like OMIM and um, Orphanet and Genomics England and so on, as well as clinical labs that are curating inside their labs. And we got all of these individuals, all of these groups to share their curated genes globally. Uh, in a database called GenCC, or the Gene Curation Coalition. We now have 16,000 gene disease relationships um, submitted uh, representing these curations from 12 different groups sharing data. Um, and this whole program um, of the ClinGen expert panels uh, involves over 2,000 volunteers around the world um, volunteering their time and expertise to contribute to the approaches we use to curate data, and in many cases, sharing the data from their own clinical labs or research labs that help contribute to understanding whether these 
genes are involved in disease or these variants cause disease. Um, and what we have found from the first 1,830 gene disease relationships we've curated is that about a quarter of these claims do not have sufficient evidence to implicate those genes in disease. And this information is helping inform how clinical labs actually develop their panels. And here is an example when Invitae um, had a panel for Brugada syndrome, which is an arrhythmia disorder. There used to be 20 genes implicated in Brugada syndrome, but, but our expert panel disputed 19 of the 20. Um, and in fact, when that happened, Invitae changed its panel to this just the one valid gene, and physicians get that by default. Now, they can go in and forcefully add on the preliminary evidence genes if they wish, but none of those are validly implicated in disease, so most patients now get tested for one gene instead of 20, 19 of which don't have a valid role in disease. So that's how we're approaching gene disease curation. But the question I posed earlier was around variants and variants of uncertain significance. So we hope to curate every gene disease relationship. There's a finite number. Variants, there's not a finite number. We have billions of variants in our genomes. So we have to use a different approach to help contribute to the curation of these um, variants. So one of those approaches is um, common standards. And we are continually building on the standards that laboratories and research programs use to classify variants. By the way, I do see that there's a question. Um, should we revisit the mandate to report VUSs in panel testing? Uh, why not modernize guidance documents to suggest a higher level of certitude for reporting? This is especially relevant with so much discussion about continuous variant review and updating reports over time. So excellent question, Matt Ferber. Um, and uh, the truth is, I um, the call I had right before this was the panel of people that are going to lecture on this at ASHG in a few weeks on exactly this topic. I'm also working to form a committee within the American College of Medical Genetics to actually put out new standards. Um, and you'll there'll be some exciting data, surveys of physicians and patients around this topic, case presentations around getting VUSs back that are absolutely going to inform a change in practice that we are advocating for. And, and in fact, in that MedArchive paper, we, we, I, you know, we talked about some of the changes that need to happen. So, um, so yes, 100%, this needs to, to change and evolve now that we're you know, sequencing more content and there's too many VUSs going back to patients. And so that topic will be more addressed in more depth. And maybe if we have time at the end for a more in-depth conversation, I'm happy to, to talk in more detail about what we need to do. Uh, so great question. Um, so getting back, you know, so common standards that we distribute to all labs, getting everyone to share their classifications in ClinVar with the supporting evidence that allows transparency and ability to share and contribute collectively to the interpretation of these variants. We then facilitate resolving conflicts between laboratories, ensuring the data underlying those classifications is shared. And when the labs don't work it out, we move it on to the expert panels that we support in ClinGen to be able to more rigorously bring in experts to classify those variants that aren't resolvable through our interlaboratory efforts. So a lot of different efforts to do this. Uh, there we go. So um, getting back to this bold prediction, the clinical relevance of all encountered genomic variants will be readily predictable running the diagnostic designation, designation of VUS obsolete. Will we achieve this by 2030? I don't think so. This is a tall task. Um, but I do believe for a subset of genetic diseases, perhaps the most common ones, um, we will understand the variants that contribute the largest fraction of disease. But we will still have a ways to go for the more rare diseases and the rarest causes of all genetic diseases. Um, and, and that is gonna continue to plague us, I believe, beyond 2030. Okay, the last area um, that I'll tackle, and that is that the regular use of genomic information will be mainstream in all clinical settings. Um, I've truncated a few of these predictions just for brevity, but, um, but that's the basic question. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about what we're doing on the front lines of genomic medicine. Um, and for those of you, you know, just a big picture look at how we use genetics in, in clinical care today. A lot of the testing we do is what we consider diagnostic tests. These are individuals with symptoms. They have cancer, they have heart disease, they have something, and we're trying to figure out if we can explain why, and perhaps it's a genetic cause. 
And those tests run the, the whole spectrum of age from prenatal abnormalities seen on ultrasound, newborn screening and pediatric care and adult medicine. But we are increasingly also using our genome um, to do screening tests and preventive genomics. These are individuals who are asymptomatic but may be at risk to develop um, genetic diseases in their lifetime. And if we were to diagnose them early, could we intervene and prevent the negative consequences of those disorders? So that's an area of increasing um, use uh, of genetics and genomics. So a few years ago, I left the primary lab that I was directing to really form a genomic medicine unit, to work at the front lines with the physicians to try to better integrate genomics into medical practice. And we engaged stakeholders, identified the pain points, and were work, have been working to deliver creative solutions. One area of need that we defined was um, those individuals who are at risk for a genetic disorder, but don't have symptoms. They often can't be seen in the specialty clinics who are backed up with patients with disease. And primary care is not well um, educated to understand genetics enough to know what test to order or how to order a genetic test for an individual who comes in and says, well, my mother died of breast cancer. Should I be concerned? Should I be tested? And that's an open question that not all physicians are prepared to answer or address. So we launched a preventive genomics clinic to address that, as well as an e-consult service, more deployable genetic counseling services, a common consent form for genetic testing, and even discovered that our physicians were ordering tests from hundreds of different labs with different quality standards, and we worked to consolidate testing across and define preferred, acceptable, and discouraged laboratories, depending on the indication. Um, this is the current team that's doing this work shown here on the left. And then we engage representatives of every division and department across the hospital who might be engaged in genetic testing to work closely with them as we disseminated best and shared best practices and approaches. Uh, and by way of example, you know, our own kidney clinic wasn't really utilizing genetics in the care of their patient population, but we were able to, to provide them a genetic counselor um, as they needed it, teach them how to just order genetic tests. Um, and in fact, in the first year um, of ordering tests, they found that the information was useful in over half of the cases that they tested. And this is just one of many cases um, shown here, an individual with chronic kidney disease identifying a UMAD mutation helping guide treatment and also be able to then test the sister and allow her to be cleared for kidney donation for this particular disorder, um, which is also a benefit of genetic testing. Uh, I mentioned the consolidation of germline testing. We've done that exercise and that information is now governing how we prioritize clinical labs for integration into our electronic health record and where we optimize services based on a, a more deliberate focus on a smaller number of labs that we can engage more deeply with. And that went through rounds of, of interfacing with clinicians and what they liked about certain labs and not other labs and all of that information to inform that with our physician populations. Um, I mentioned the preventive genomics clinic that we launched in the first couple of hundred patients seen. Um, the highest need in our healthcare system was in hereditary cancer susceptibility. Um, second was in preconception carrier screening, also interpreting direct to consumer tests that were showing up in the PCP's hands and they didn't know what to do with. And then a variety of other things um, here. Uh, almost half were referrals from primary care. And this was the population we were targeting. And another quarter were self-referred individuals who knew they had a risk weren't getting the help they needed and referred themselves to our clinic. Uh, and then a quarter were from specialists, um, usually when they couldn't see the patients and they were directing them for asymptomatic at-risk individuals. Um, most of the individuals did have real genetic risk based on family history and other markers. Um, and in fact, as a result, uh, testing was ordered on a number, um, three quarters of them and 80% paid nothing for genetic testing because they actually met um, guidelines for uh, genetic testing being at risk. Um, now, our clinic is not large enough to see actually the hundreds and thousands of patients that need this type of, of care and counseling and testing. Um, and so we also launched an e-consult service where we could just simply answer the questions of the physicians as they were engaging with patients. And in fact, this is instead of do one, this is teach one, right? Because uh, physician asks the question, we answer it. 
they then deploy that knowledge in the care of their patient. Then when the second patient comes in, they now know how to do it and they can do it on their own. And that's the kind of teaching and, and cycle of learning that we want to support. And in fact, scaling genomics in clinical medicine will require support for primary care to play a major role in genetic and genomic testing. We also followed up on the outcomes of the first 100 e-consults in terms of what was actually done. Um, most 61% of these um, requests did come from PCPs. They were all unique questions, which again emphasizes the learning that's happening. They're not just asking the same question for every patient that has it. They're asking it once, they're learning from it, and then that allows them to deploy it. Um, so uh, in these cases, in some cases, we did recommend a genetic evaluation. Uh, in some cases, non-genetic labs were recommended and not genetic. So again, teaching what, what to do in what circumstance. Sometimes we even discourage genetic testing. No, this is not an indication that's, that's commonly a genetic cause. Uh, or help them interpret previous genetic testing results or advised on a screening plan, uh, determine a referral was no longer indicated, or suggest that they have someone else in the family be tested, which is actually quite common. So these are the kinds of things that we were teaching and coaching through these e-consult services. Um, and um, the last topic I'll, I'll mention is an interesting little side project we've been doing. So we're, we're funded as part of the Rare as One Network through the Chan Zuckerberg Initiative. And we've been working with um, rare disease uh, advocacy organizations um, who are trying to um, really work on behalf of their patient population, ideally ending in the development of therapeutics for their patient populations and their, um, the families they, they work with. And one of the biggest barriers is convincing the, the pharmaceutical companies to invest in the development of drugs for their patient population when it's unclear how many individuals even have the disease because that size of the population is something that's gonna dictate priority for pharmaceutical development. So we've been able to use our NOMAD database to determine the prevalence of these disorders in the absence of actual patient registries based on, uh, and this works really well for recessive diseases, it's a little more challenging for others because we can use carrier rates in the general population to inform the, um, the prevalence of these disorders. And so we've worked with now 11 different organizations um, and curated many diseases and genes to be able to inform the, um, the, the population prevalence of their disorders. And they've found this incredibly useful in talking to pharmaceutical companies. So it's just an, another element of how we really progress this field because ultimately we want to not just diagnose, but in fact, treat and improve outcomes. Um, so if we get back to that bold prediction, the regular use of genomic information will be mainstream in all clinical settings. Will we achieve this by 2030? Um, I do believe that we will have tra transitioned to genomes for most genetic services. I'm still not yet convinced that all specialties will have embraced genetics sufficiently by 2030. I think there's still learning to be done. Um, and I also ha still have concerns about equity and access. We still have a long ways to come to ensure that every individual has equal access to genetic services and the care that it can provide. Um, so with that, I do wanna thank an enormous um, team behind the scenes that does a lot of the work that I, I shared with you today um, and, and work that I haven't shared with you today, but I'm happy to stop there. And I think we have plenty of time for questions um, from the audience and hopefully you'll, you'll have some good ones for me. And I am back and monitoring questions. And if there aren't any questions, I am loaded with questions. Bring them on. All right. <laughs> Um, uh, audience, please put your questions in the Q&A. So I alluded to the fact that I'm a primary care internist, and I'm also the associate director for education who came on board to this wonderful team in the Center for Individualized Medicine here in Rochester with a goal of integrating genomics into primary care and frontline medicine. And so I've done a little bit of reading and things. And I would be very curious, Dr. Reem, to your comments and thoughts about the CDC's recommendation to look at tier one genetic diseases and screening for which there really are three, Lynch syndrome, the hereditary breast and ovarian cancer syndromes, and also familial hypercholesterolemia um, as identified as really conditions that have huge implications for populations. Um, and the fact that if we look at familial hypercholesterolemia, it's not really 
truly a rare disease, and you've talked a lot about rare diseases, and yet it has catastrophic implications for not making the diagnosis early. Um, and it's really something as an adult, taking care of adult patients, that we do need to identify our adults because there are implications for children as well. So I, I welcome your comments on how do we start to do that? Because the data out there about can we develop screening programs is really uh, limited and we don't know how to do it right yet. So I'd love to hear what your thoughts are. Yeah, it's a great question. And, you know, I was talking to Moon Curry, um, who, you know, clarified, and, and a lot of people misunderstand this, but those recommendations were not to launch population-based screening programs where everybody in the population gets screened. It was more um, akin to some of the ACMG recommendations where if you're doing testing, these are things you should return in the absence of phenotype at, uh, at risk. And there's there's subtle difference there, right? Um, as you think about rolling out a population program where everyone gets screened, you have to think a little bit differently about how to manage that and and uh, the benefits and drawbacks, you know, to that. But there is no doubt in my mind that if you get your genome sequenced and you have a variant that's pathogenic for any one of those three tier one disorders that you, it should absolutely be returned because there's very good evidence on the penetrance, which is reasonably high for all three of those disorders, um, as well as the ability to intervene and improve outcomes. And that is why the CDC put them on the tier two list. But it remains an open question of, should we actually implement a population level screening program for these three disorders? And a lot of people would argue absolutely yes. Um, unfortunately, insurance isn't universally covering this, which makes it hard for those of us in the clinical care side to, to recommend it and implement it. Um, but I will say it's starting to happen organically because large employers are offering this as benefits for their employees. Um, and in fact, a lot of the screening is more happening at that level, whether it's Walmart or it's Home Depot or it's Amazon, you know, they're putting this in their their enticement packages as part of employee retention, employee, you know, um, sort of benefits. And that is where you're starting to see large scale population screening happening more so, honestly, than directed by our healthcare system, which is a little frustrating from my standpoint as someone living in the, um, the you know, medical community. But it, it, it is allowing us to see and, and take a look at what we can do in this space and, and watch the benefits um, that are re being reaped from broader screening. And we have countless examples of families that found out this information early enough to intervene and they were not aware that, of the high risk that they had. Um, and so, so I am a proponent of, of this. You know, as you get to some other disorders where we don't understand penetrance as well, uh, and that's true of some of the other disorders, honestly, on the ACMG secondary findings list, like long QT, cardiomyopathy, you know, there are individuals that are positive for pathogenic variant, don't have disease, and honestly, it's a little unclear what their risk is because we don't have as good population level studies of penetrance and unselected populations to really guide their risk. That doesn't mean we can't return that information, but we have to be educated to say, we found this variant, it puts you at higher risk, but it, it's not a life sentence here. You may never develop the disease. Um, and we have to educate our clinician population to understand what is the screening approach, you know, and how can we monitor for disease, but doesn't necessarily mean that every person with a long QT variant should have a device, you know, implanted. And we have to think carefully about what are the guidance for each of these scenarios. And that's still an evolving area. I think you highlight the really the critical role that the clinical geneticists have because that educational piece and the time to have that discussion is something that certainly primary care docs don't have. Yeah. We do have a question in the Q&A and are you able to see those? Yes, I can. Okay. Um, it says, going back to the panel conversation, I 100% agree with your thoughts and data. I feel like genomic medicine is moving fast, but how do we get the insurance companies up to speed on covering genomics routinely? I feel like sometimes panels are a default clinically due to insurance coverage. Yes, and I 100% agree. And in fact, that is why I worked with these 19 labs to get this data and show 
you know, very clearly from real empiric data that's representing what is actually happening across our entire U.S. population uh, and prove to them that, in fact, genomes are not only higher yield, but they actually reduce the uncertainty. So that's one piece of the puzzle. That said, there's still uncertainty being released. Um, and, you know, I think some of the other approaches are not these just default plans of reporting, but in fact, to allow the physician to be able to say, gee, this individual is an adopted individual. There's no, no this disorder that I'm suspecting has no follow-up options. A VUS is just going to create uncertainty with no ability to follow up. Don't give me those back. On the other hand, you have, you know, patient with suspected alpha galactosidase or, or um, Fabry disease, let's say, and you do a test for GLA variants. Well, there's a definitive enzyme test you can run if that individual is positive. And, and so the ability to follow up on VOS is in circumstances like that, where there is some follow up to clarify the significance of the variant, those are scenarios where you may want to get the VUSs back. And I think between the clinician, the laboratories, we need to develop nuances. Also, most VUSs get downgraded to benign. Uh, and that is just the reality of variation in our genomes. And so we should really subdivide the VUSs and focus on reporting the top tier that we're, we have a lot of evidence, but they're not quite there and a little bit more will get them there. Most of these actually move up when we're reporting those. And so I think, you know, allowing the laboratory to say, you don't have to report them all, report this tier. And here's some guidance for how to subdivide your VUSs and what constitutes evidence to put them in that top tier. Then the physicians might be more willing to spend the time and, and do the subsequent clinical studies on just a small percentage of the population generating lower cost in follow-up for the insurance companies um, and really targeted efforts at the, the right variants that, that will are more likely to yield an answer. So I, I think you know, we need to work together to nuance this setting um, and, and help guide that. One of the most cost-effective things, I think a majority of physicians, and I'm speaking to the primary care population of physicians can do is spend the time getting a good history. Mm -hmm. For a lot of these things, such as familial uh, breast and ovarian hereditary cancer syndromes, um, do the family history. Um, the data is really quite clear that as you start to stratify the likelihood of risk, there are very good tools out there that will start to identify who are the people you should be suspicious of. And you get that information even about familial hypercholesterolemia, looking for early sudden deaths, or for Lynch syndrome, you know, who had colon cancer, how old were they, when did they have colon polyps? And so the challenge is, I think, to make those of us who are primary care doctors go back to what you learned in medical school mm -hmm. and take the extra 10 minutes instead of worrying necessarily about, do I get a panel? Do I send them for a single gene abnormality? Do they need a clinical geneticist? Talk to your patient, ask them to talk to their family members, even at Thanksgiving, at the dinner table and say, so how's your health? Because yeah. usually the pushback I get is, well, I don't talk to Bill about mm -hmm. when he had his colonoscopy. And yet that information can be so critically important in helping guide as we try to risk assessment our patients. So I think once we start to emphasize that, we can really, as primary care docs, start to integrate the genomics. Because once you start to do that, it starts to make a lot of sense. Yeah, and, and I, I, I completely agree with you. And I think one of the challenges is, how do we make this easy? Because the physicians already have massive time constraint and, and the time to go retype in information into the lab's you know, requisition form is a barrier. You know, We want all this information. We, we can clearly justify the need for it, but we recognize that it's a burden on the physician. So we need to develop better tools so that we're not using our EHRs simply as billing systems, but we're actually collecting phenotype data that has value for the physician can be electronically transmitted to the lab who can use it in that format and it's not a re-entry of information. And in fact, there's a cycle back. So, you know, if the US's or likely path or even path variants are reported, was that patient ultimately diagnosed um, with that disorder? Were there follow-up clinical studies that reinforced or informed that VUS that can then cycle back to the lab 
to reinterpret that variant uh, and that sort of you know learning healthcare cycle. So we need better tools to enable the communication between the healthcare systems and the laboratory and back and forth if we're really going to build this knowledge base and reduce the strain on, on systems. And as you pointed out quite um, accurately, we need to engage the patients, the families. A lot of this information is there and they need to gather it from their family members. And if we can give a portal to the patients whose interest it is to give the most accurate information, we can actually offload some of this effort from the physicians onto the patients to enter family history, phenotype information, uh, and other information that can also be um, enhanced the interpretation. One of our uh, attendees pointed out that non-provider staff can get much of this information gathering with training uh, due to provider, prov primary providers being stretched for time. And I'm fond of saying, make it harder for the provider to do the wrong thing than the right thing. That's right. There's um, a and yeah, Go ahead. So that question about non-provider. So um, we have been in, employing increasing numbers of genetic counseling assistants, as well as genetic counselors, uh, deploying them to um, both primary care and specialty care clinics. Um, because sometimes just like how to fill out a requisition form and the information needed to order a genetic test. Um, we have, you know, assistants that are training to be genetic counselors, a very cost-effective approach to help facilitate this for the physicians. Um, and, and those solutions can both educate and provide and offload some of the, the work involved. So I think we have to be, you know, really creative about how to support this with very practical solutions. There's another comment in the Q&A. Uh, Dr. Reem, thank you so much for the brilliant talk. May I ask what you think of PRS? How well adopted are they in your practice and experience? A great question and very timely. Um, so there's you know, increasing interest and studies and data on polygenic risk scores um, and controversy over their utility. Um, we are supporting right now a large study for the eMERGE, NIH-funded eMERGE program, returning uh, polygenic risk scores across, I think, 12 different disease areas into like 10 different healthcare systems across the U.S., and then really studying what, what is done with that information and how it's useful or not. Um, and I think the real question here is, I do think long-term that polygenic risk scores, which have improved in their predictive um, capability over time, will have information that will help stratify populations and help guide where to focus certain interventions uh, and focusing them at the highest risk populations for certain approaches that can mitigate risk. Um, They're not useful in a diagnostic sense. So if someone already has diabetes or obesity, and you find that they had a high PRS score or a low, doesn't matter. They already have it. You're not going to change your approach. Your approach is based on their symptoms for the most part, maybe some exceptions there. But it's really about the asymptomatic at risk and how you stratify and think about distribution of care and focus of care. Um, and so I think that is where it, it, it will really um, be important. Uh, unfortunately, a lot of these PRS scores to date have only been formed by European ancestry populations, so they're not as useful in um, a more diverse population. That is being corrected. We're generating um, uh, genomic data on a million individuals through the All of Us Research Program. We'll release um, the next tranche of a quarter million genomes, and this population has been recruited for very high diversity. And that will allow us to actually understand this in not only European you know, ancestral populations, but in fact, a much more diverse and allow this information to stratify um, risk across all of the populations that we need to treat. So I think there's still much work to be done and figuring out, so with what score do you do what with? Um, but you know, we'll, we'll be learning this and figuring this out. And I, I do think over time, there will be a place for polygenic risk scores, but not really an embryo selection, can I say right now, despite there being clinical labs that are actually doing that, so side comment. Um, we have one more question, and I think it's really uh, pertinent, so I want to get it in right before we get to the top of the hour. A wonderful talk. Comments on non-genetic factor like epigenetic components in disease progression and prediction of potential epigenetic testing in the clinic or at the population level. 
Yeah, and this is, you know, an emerging area of, of just understanding the epigenetic factors that influence regulation of genes and their expression and, and other factors. And, you know, we're still trying to tap into the basic primary cause, let alone, um, you know, a lot of the epigenetic factors. But for absolutely, there will be many non-genetic factors, not just epigenetic, but um, environmental and, you know, um, like, do you smoke? Do you, um, what's your family history? Well, that's genetic, but, but a number of factors that will help influence how we stratify patients. So it won't just be PRS scores. Um, also, when we think about penetrance of disease, um, you know, the same, two individuals, both of the same pathogenic variant, both at risk for disease, one lives till 80 years old and never develops a disease, the other develops at age 30. What's the difference? Well, undoubtedly, there will be some epigenetic factors. So is the allele with the, with the um, mutation on it expressed more highly in one individual than the other based on epigenetic factors that control the regulation and expression of one allele versus another as just an example of that. And studies are, are starting to be done to look at differential expression of alleles and other ways that our epigenome affects the expression of genes and disease that they're associated with. So this, this is a factor. We, we, we're only at the tip of the iceberg in understanding mechanisms today, but I think we will gain more appreciation for this, this role in disease over time. With that, I would like to thank Dr. Heidi Rehm for an absolutely wonderful talk today and really a, a close-up and, and global look at the challenges we face with genomic medicine and, and really, I think, a lot of promise for where we're going and some amazing sort of insights into how we're working across the globe to really work together and learn some new things. And with that last comment, I do want to go ahead and plug the Exposome Conference on Genomics that we'll be hosting here in November at the Mayo Clinic in the Rochester. Thank you all for attending. I hope you enjoyed it as much as I did. Uh, have a wonderful uh, afternoon or close up for morning and enjoy your lunch to those on the West Coast. Uh, thank you, Dr. Reem, very much. It was my pleasure. Take care, everyone. <laughs>